everyone. This is Cassandra Harris from MD Anderson Cancer Center in the Department of Health Disparities Research. Thanks for joining the webinar. And I'd like to also extend a thanks to Julie and her team for inviting me to be a part of the webinar, as well as Carrie and Lynn for all their hard work in making this happen today. The topic that I'd like to talk about is clinical trials education, think out the box. Today I'd like to, at the end of our talk, hopefully encourage you to use a fun way of educating others about clinical trial participation as well as have you be able to adapt this bingo format for education around cancer issues. During the course of our time today, I'd like to talk about my department, the Department of Health Disparities Research at MD Anderson, talk a little bit about clinical trials information, describe the bingo tool in which we've used, share data, talk about tips for replication, and if there's time, we can play the game as well. I mentioned that I worked at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I work in the Department of Health Disparities Research in a center called the Center for Community Education and Translational Research. And our center is formed to help investigators implement research in community health settings and support the recruitment and retention of minorities and women to clinical trials at MD Anderson. My role specifically involves connecting researchers with community groups that are interested in partnering with MD Anderson on research studies. I assist them with education programs, with program development, with participation navigation activities of their studies, and I also work with their community advisory boards. To get started, I just want to talk a little bit about clinical trials, and then later on we'll get into some more details about the bingo tool. Clinical trials are research studies in which people volunteer. They help find better ways to prevent, diagnose, and treat cancer. They can provide individual as well as collective benefits. And today, people everywhere benefit from research-based discoveries. In fact, 10 million cancer survivors are alive today because of the advances made through research. The Center for Information for the Study of Clinical Trial Participation released a study and these are the top five reasons why people participate in clinical trials. The first one is if the person found benefit for themselves or someone else if they knew all about the risk, if the rewards outweighed the risk, if there was a cure, and if their doctor recommended it. And in many cases we find that many doctors don't share information about clinical trials with their patients. So this tool is also developed in order to help individuals be more of an advocate for themselves. You also may be wondering who participates in clinical trials. And out of all the individuals that are part of clinical trials, 60% of those individuals are children with cancer. Only 25% are over the age of 65. Only 10% are teenagers. Only about 3 to 5% of the adult population participate in clinical trials, and that's a small number and an even smaller number are racial and ethnic groups that participate in clinical trials. I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, time frame for approval of drugs and treatments to clinical trials. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because we want to save some time at the end for the game. But it can take up to 14 years before a drug or treatment is approved by the FDA to be used in humans. It starts off with uh, animal or laboratory studies and then it goes into phases. 
And I have a handout that provides specific information about the different phases of clinical trials. And as you can see on the slide, the first trial only involves a small number of patients, 15 to 30. And then in phase two, it increases to a little bit less than 100 patients. In phase three, there's more patients that are involved. And then it goes on for approval to FDA. Understanding the facts about clinical trials can be a way to help others make informed decisions about participation. And that's uh, one of the reasons why I developed the game, is to help patients make informed decisions. One of the things that we do in our office as well is to help to reduce barriers to participation. What's listed on the slide are a few participant barriers. There's also uh, institutional barriers or facilitator barriers or physician barriers. But I'll just talk about these for now. And the biggest barrier when you ask people why they think individuals do not participate in clinical trials is fear. A lot of times clinical trials are not seen as a treatment option for patients. It could also be lack of awareness, financial costs, and lack of insurance. And as I mentioned, there's many others. Now it's time for audience participation. And I do have a prize. So if you're on the line, feel free to use the uh, clicker to raise your hand if you know the answer. Well, just give me your, your response. How many of you have benefited, feel that you have benefited from a clinical trial? By a show of hands. Maria showed hands. <laughs> okay, we have two hands, three hands up. <laughs> Okay, if you are a survivor, well, in fact, many of us have participated in clinical trials. If you've ever taken aspirin, if you've ever taken a uh, anti-acid prescription drug, you have participated or benefited from a clinical trial. And if you're a breast cancer survivor, I have listed a few trials that were instrumental in treatment of breast cancer today. And I'll go over some information about these trials right now. This first trial in 1953 provided the first evidence that chemotherapy could decrease recurrence. In 1976, this trial looked at lumpectomy with lymph node removal and radiation, and it was found to be an effective treatment option for reducing recurrence as well. In 1992, tamoxifen was found to prevent the development of invasive breast cancer in women with ductal carcinoma in situ. And in 1999, we heard about raloxifen, and it, just like tamoxifen, reduces breast cancer risk about 50% in high-risk women. In 2000, Herceptin was combined with chemotherapy, and it was found to reduce the risk of recurrence in women with early-stage disease. The list goes on and on. If you uh, check the National Cancer Institute's website, you'll find a list of current breast cancer trials that are completed and that uh, researchers are using right now in their treatment modalities. As far as cancer health disparities are concerned, there are still higher cancer disparities for minorities and women. There's also low participation of minorities in clinical trials. And this is also time for uh, audience participation as well. So we'll see uh, your hands go up, and I do have a prize. It's been about 20 years since special task forces were developed to address cancer disparities and health disparities. And we still are experiencing the same results. Uh, minorities still have higher incidences and mortality rates of some cancers, and also the participation rates are very low. My question for the group today, and you can answer by a show of hands, I'll give you a multiple choice question. When were researchers required to include women and minorities in clinical trials? 
was it A, 1930, B, 1955, or C, 1993? Oh, I'm sorry. Now show me in your hands for A. If you choose A, 1930, raise your hand. Okay. If you choose 1955, raise your hand. Okay, one. If you chose 1993, raise your hand. Okay, the answer is 1993. So if you're on the phone, <laughs> two people, okay, Jenny and Jenny, Gina and Jenny, I will send you a prize. It wasn't until 1993 that the federal government required researchers to include minorities and women in clinical trials. And that was not so long ago. So it's very alarming to find that information out. Because without adequate representation of diverse populations in clinical trials, researchers cannot learn about potential differences and cannot ensure that the results of their study would benefit all populations. And for many individuals, the first time they hear the words clinical trials is following a diagnosis. So creating a general awareness about clinical trials may be helpful in reducing the barrier of lack of awareness to clinical trials and helping individuals make informed decisions about participation. Because we know from the research studies that I've mentioned with breast cancer, those studies have been very effective and many individuals choose not to even participate. <laughs> okay, so it's time for us to think out of the box. And when we're thinking out of the box, we have to think of programs that will capture individuals' attention, programs or educational sessions that won't take up too much time, and we don't always have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of best practices that are available to us, a lot of evidence-based programs that we can adapt for our use. And so my goal today is to encourage you guys to think out the box and to think about utilizing a gamification format or a game format to educate others about cancer issues and specifically about clinical trials. Many years ago, and Maria is here from the American Cancer Society, they developed a breast health awareness bingo game. And I was a volunteer at that time and got trained and everyone in the community loved that game. And it was breast health information presented in a game format. And when it came time for us to think of a tool to develop to educate individuals about clinical trials at our office, I thought about the breast health awareness bingo game and invented or developed or adapted the bingo game for breast health to clinical trials. And we're so glad that we did. Uh, we pilot tested the program and we've been implementing it. And I'll share some data with you shortly. And also, just to let you know that the bingo format has been used all over the United States. They have been used in colleges and schools, by community organizations, by universities, to educate others about health. There's recent research on using gamification in public health, using games to educate. Research is showing that when people are playing a game, they like to win prizes, they like to be challenged, and this helps them to uh, retain information, and in some cases, behavior change. And this was presented at a recent uh, workshop at the UT School of Public Health. We shared this bingo tool with our colleagues and everybody that we could reach, and the Leukemia Lymphoma Society cards, bingo cards, bingo chips, handouts, and incentives. It takes about 30 minutes to implement, and it requires the participants to listen and actively participate in the information sharing. During the course of the bingo game, it welcomes stories and input and comments from the audience. It allows the participant to be engaged throughout the entire presentation. I even get individuals that tell us stories about the time that they participated in clinical trials and how that made them feel. 
The bingo card is listed on the slide as you see. It's a small version. But again, it's pictures with the exception of the MD Anderson logo. And individuals mark their spaces once they see a picture that will be shown to them by the facilitator. Once all the cards have been read, the bingo game and the presentation has been given. Just to give you an example, this is an example of a facilitator card, the front of the card. And you don't have to be an expert, just like with the Breast Health Awareness Bingo, to provide information on clinical trials. The information um, on the facilitator card relates to the picture that is given. On the back of the facilitator card is all the information <coughs> that's needed to provide the messages about clinical trials. The information is provided in English as well as in Spanish. I also wanted to share some of the data that we collected during the course of pilot testing the clinical trials bingo. And we pilot tested it from May through August in 2010, and we reached about 54 people at that time. We had about 89% of the individuals who were part of the pilot test were females, 46% were survivors, and out of all of those people, 83% had never participated in a clinical trial. And I found that interesting since 46% of those individuals were survivors. These were some of the uh, evaluation questions that we presented. And we found that 97% said that they felt people should know about clinical trials. We had really high marks, and I need to uh, revise our evaluation because they were just too positive. So I think I need to, <laughs> to change it up and do something different. 95% said that they had a better understanding of clinical trials. 89% said they had a better understanding of the risk and benefits. So we try to include more information when we've done it in the implementation phase. 95% said that they believe clinical trials can be a treatment option. And this one uh, was kind of similar. This was the lowest ranking. I believe systems are in place to protect people who participate in clinical trials. I think around that time there were some uh, clinical trial news events that surfaced, and so that made people kind of leery. The media helps us, but it hurts us as well. Here are some more questions. Uh, the bingo game was a good way to learn about clinical trials, 98%. And this was, you know, my, my real focus of doing the pilot test. Is this a great way to impart information? And when I talked to my colleagues, some of them said, well, you know, this might be a fun way for individuals who are not survivors. You know, this probably is good for uh, general public. But when I presented it to survivors, they enjoyed it as well. I believe that clinical trials can be helpful. That was 97% of those surveyed. Comfortable asking questions about clinical trials, 96%. And 95% felt that others could benefit from a presentation on clinical trials. Now this slide gives information about both the pilot and implementation groups. And I just grouped them into categories uh, by the percentage of individuals reached in those groups. And as you can see, the largest groups were uh, women, was women only. The next largest were survivors. And then I had church groups that were either health or wellness groups. And then some professionals. I presented it at the Texas Society for Public Health Education Conference in College Station and also to some other professionals as well. And in total, we reached 207 people with the evaluations. Uh, 207 evaluations were returned, but we reached almost 300 people. We had um, 11 groups total that we presented the bingo game to. And this um, just gives you 
some information about the comments that we received from the different groups. The first one came from the American, the Asian American Cancer Training that we attended, and uh, one person said, "Excellent group interaction will help me remember a lot of the information shared." The Women's Fund has an annual women's uh, event, and we were invited back this past year to present it. And one participant said, it was good. Thank you. And uh, we did, uh, American Cancer Society had a training for uh, some individuals there. And one person said, excellent education tool. So we keep track of all our comments so that we can prove and add in information that individuals might think would be missing. This was a church group. Uh, it was a cancer awareness group that included both survivors and non-survivors. And it said, I feel others could benefit from this information. Also, another church group, Windsor Village United Methodist Church. This was a group of all survivors as well. And they thought it was a great gain for knowledge. And then I, I brought it to our hospital and presented it to our uh, picnic session for our Anderson Network patients. And one patient said, the game made it fun. Can you make one for chemo brain? So we're talking to our patient education office and trying to make some of their presentations a little bit fun as well. And then we presented to Sisters Network. One individual said, creative information. African Americans need much reassurance and education. OK, now, I hope by this time that I encourage you to consider developing a bingo game around cancer awareness or clinical trials or some other health topic. It is very easy to do and it's fun. The first thing that you need to do is to identify your topic, whether it's cancer or treatment options or health or wellness. Identify your topic and develop a PowerPoint presentation. And you have to be sure to include lots of pictures and the pictures have to relate to your information. Initially, with, uh, within our pilot stage, I used this, uh, this link, instabingocard.com, but there are several other uh, bingo software programs that you can utilize, and all you have to do is uh, upload your information and your pictures, and they generate the cards for you. So it's easy and it's, it's not time consuming once you have your presentation outline and your pictures. Give the presentation using the bingo format to see how it, it flows. Evaluate, review, and, re, and revise it. And you will get some, some quirks, but um, it's easy to do and it's fun. And people are very good at helping you to uh, test your tool. We did that in the pilot stage. We asked individuals about the wording that we use when we imparted the information, as well as the pictures. So again, identify your topic, draft a PowerPoint presentation, get some software to help you generate your bingo card, give your presentation, and evaluate it. And we reached, um, I mentioned earlier, almost 300 individuals within all the ethnic groups there were more males than females that participated. The majority of the people who participated or returned the surveys had not participated in the clinical trials. There was an overwhelming response to the use of the game as an educational tool. And several individuals expressed an interest in being trained to facilitate the game themselves. So, if you're in the Houston area, we will have a clinical trials bingo facilitator training on June the 28th, and the session will include a presentation on clinical trials, a review of the bingo kit and how to use it, and program mechanics, how you collaborate with MD Anderson and the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Okay, hey, that's the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? We will have some time, I see, to play the bingo. And uh, those of you on the phone might have the opportunity to play as well. Mm -hmm.
Can I ask a question? Yes, Lynn has a question. Um, are you willing to take it on the road other than just Houston? Would you be able to do a training at um, in any other parts of the state? I may could probably do it like a tele training because I don't have money for travel. Hi, Gina. You have a question? Yes, hi. Um, there was a slide about the facilitator card, and on the back I had the Spanish and English on that. Uh huh. But what was that? Can you show that slide again? What was that facilitator card? The facilitator cards are the information that's presented during the course of the game, and the facilitator shows the picture to the participants while reading the information from the back of a card uh -huh. and the participants when they see the picture they have a bingo card that has loads of pictures on it okay. and they put their marker on the participant card and when they get five in a row they holler out bingo okay so it's not like a quiz in them. no we're not quizzing them it's just like bingo it's a game all they have to do is look for the bingo Okay. A picture on their bingo card and place okay. their bingo chip on the card. Gotcha. Okay. Any Thank other you. any other questions? Um, have you thought about even doing this session for like the CHW conference they're having in San Antonio? No, I haven't. This would be great for the CHW conference. Yeah, and it would be nice to do it in Spanish. Oh, also, like you yeah. have someone translated at the same time. I don't know if they're the cards are both in English and Spanish, right. so I have several copies. Mm -hmm. But if you were doing the actual training to help the students, you know, the people that participate. Yeah, because some of the CHWs are only Spanish speaking. There's a lot of formatories. Oh, so I want to say we can do two sessions, like a Spanish yeah. only session and an English session. session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if they have time. It would be, that, would, that would be a good tool for that. Yeah, this would be a great tool for them. Yeah. Do you have another question, Gina? Jana, did you have another question? No, I forgot to take off my hand. Okay. Okay, so now we are ready to play the game. Mm -hmm. So I emailed everybody. Um, the email that I sent about 45 minutes before this started, everybody got a bingo card in that email that they could open up and um, print out and use, or you can try to do it on your computer screen. Or if you um, can't find the email, there's also at the top left-hand corner where it says files, there's one called Bingo Card 12. You can just open that up for yourself and use that. And you'll also see there's um, a handout and the presentation that Cassandra just did also in that file for you to download. So we're just getting ready in here to play it ourselves. Do we get a prize if we win? Yes, you do. I have five. <laughs> it's a trip to the Cayman Islands. Yes. <laughs> Sweet. Compliments of Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for those of you on the phone, have you found your bingo card yet? Yes. Okay. So what we will do, and maybe... I did not send you the PowerPoint of the card, facilitated cards. No. Okay, so what I will do, I will describe, for those of you who are on the phone, the picture that you have on your bingo card. The free space is the MD Anderson space, and we'll play until someone bingos, and I didn't shuffle up the cards, so I don't know who has a winning card or how long we'll play. But the first card, and this might be hard for some of you on the phone, but the first card is a group of individuals of various ages, and there's an African-American lady holding a baby with a red scarf. Do you see that? Yes, I do. On the phone? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, and this one just says, at MD Anderson, we believe that everyone should know about clinical trials. One of the center's goals is to increase the participation of minorities and women in clinical trials. And then I talk about, it wasn't until 1993 that the inclusion of women and minorities in clinical trials were required. And this was the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993. And I'm reading from the back of the facilitator card, which is also in Spanish. Okay, you ready to go? The next card lists 
or includes a group of people, various ages, that are standing in a circle with their faces looking up into the sky. Do you have that one? Various individuals standing in a circle. And this says, I hope you enjoy learning more about clinical trials as you play this game. <laughs> so this is very, very fun, uh, informal way of imparting information. <laughs> the next slide is more serious, and it's a picture of a, a gentleman, older gentleman and his wife. They both are wearing scarves. And it just says, before we talk about clinical trials, let's talk about the cancer burden. And then again, this is audience participation. How many of you know someone with cancer? Okay, almost everybody. And then during the course of the presentation, when I'm doing it in the community, some people will, you know, talk about their family member or their friends. Then I go on to give information about the statistics. And also that research shows that minorities often suffer higher death rates from cancer than whites. In addition, racial and ethnic minorities also participate less on clinical trials. Okay, this is slide number four. And this is the slide that I showed you, the facilitator card one, the young gentleman with a, a white lab coat and some goggles, uh, putting uh, something into a test tube. Oh, I forgot to show y'all. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So you described it so beautifully. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it says clinical trials, it gives the definition of clinical trials. Clinical trials are research studies in which people, in which involve people who volunteer. A person can withdraw from a clinical trial at any time, Research studies help find better ways to prevent, diagnose, and treat cancer. And then it goes over uh, who participates in clinical trials, which I shared with you earlier. And uh, it talks about uh, the smallest percentage of individuals who participate on clinical trials are minority. And that it's important for participation in order to know if the, the benefits or the drugs that are being tested can be used in various populations. Are you guys still with us? Yeah. Okay. Slide number five is a question mark. Any bingos? Not yet. Okay. And this was the audience participation that you guys participated in. How many of you have been believed that you've benefited in a clinical trial? And then I go over what I told you before. And then I, I ask how many of you have participated in a clinical trial? Okay, three of us here have participated in a clinical trial. And at that time when I'm doing this uh, game in the community, they tell about the trial that they participated in, how they found out about the trial, um, how they were treated, if they would tell other people to participate in the trial. And then I go into the reasons why people participate, and we also talk about why people do not participate in clinical trials. Okay, slide number six is a lady with her thumb up. <laughs> and it relates to hearing sometimes negative information about clinical trials on the news. And I give information from a study that talks about um, research or a survey that they did on people who did participate in clinical trials. And it was a Harris Interactive Study, and they had about 6,000 individuals that participated. And 97% of those individuals who were surveyed said that they were treated with dignity and respect. 97% rated their quality of care as excellent or good because some individuals think that if they go on a clinical trial or leave their position, that they're not going to receive the care that they, they should receive. 93% described their overall experience as positive. And 76% said that they would recommend participation in clinical trials to someone else. And we realize that participating in clinical trials may not be good for everyone, but our whole purpose is to help individuals make informed decisions. And then again, we talk about reasons why individuals don't participate in clinical trials. Okay, any bingos? Okay, number seven is a sticky note push pin with the word eligibility on it. Sticky note push pin. And this talks about the possible risk of participating in clinical trials. 
and I list about six risks on the facilitator card, unknown or unexpected side effects. The trial might not be better than what the standard treatment is. Side effects may be worse than the known side effects with current drugs. The trial may not work for every participant. Some of the procedures used may be uncomfortable. Participation may take a lot of time. And also to be considered for a clinical trial, you must fit the eligibility requirements. You may be asked questions about uh, your, if you have high blood pressure, if you have high cholesterol, to determine your eligibility if you smoke, if you don't smoke. So there's a lot of things that go into whether or not a person can participate in a clinical trial. We also talk about the IRB and that there's strict rules and regulations that researchers have to follow and how there's patient protection. <laughs> All right. And you know, also ask if there are any questions as we go along, so feel free. That's number seven. No bingos yet? No. Oh my goodness. Okay, now the next slide, slide number eight, is a slide of a lady with red fingernail polish on and an ink pen in her hand. You guys still with me? It says, participation in a clinical trial is completely voluntary. A lot of individuals think once they join that they can't get out of the study, so they're hesitant about participating. Individuals who meet eligibility requirements for the study may be asked to participate. For example, and I talked about this earlier, if you smoke, you may be invited to participate in the study to help you quit. If you're a cancer patient, you may be asked to participate in the study to test a new drug or a new treatment that is related to your cancer stage or type. When you participate in a study, you'll be asked to sign a consent form. And that's what the lady is signing on the picture. Signing the form means that you have been provided with details of the study and that you understand that <coughs> some individuals think that they're signing away their life. It means that you have been given information about the study and the procedures of the study and that you understand them. Some individuals may be concerned about placebo. And we talk about placebo, and placebos are rarely used in cancer clinical trials. Cancer patients are given placebos in a randomized trial only under unusual circumstances. If a placebo is used, researchers may give patients in a control group a placebo in combination with the standard treatment to compare standard treatment alone to standard treatment with a new drug. And in all individuals on a clinical trial receive at least the standard of care or additional treatment. And again, if anyone feels uncomfortable in participating with a clinical trial, they have to write the right to withdraw. And this does not change their quality of care. Okay, no bingos. We're going to slide number nine. And this slide is a picture of a patient in a red Nike shirt talking to their physician. I'm so close. Okay, we have some close bingos over here on the phones. Are you close to bingoing? It says there are six common types of clinical trial, and the first one is called therapeutic or treatment trial. And therapeutic trials investigate the effect of new drugs, techniques, or procedures, or other treatment methods on people with specific types and stages of cancer. So again, this, this bingo is informing individuals about cancer, about clinical trials, and the resources that are available to them. The next slide, slide number 10, is a no smoking sign. Bingo! All right, we have a bingo, and it's Miss Perry. Let's clap. Give her a hand on the phone. so much. Okay, and slide number 10 says uh, this relates to prevention trials. Pre prevention trials are for healthy individuals and individuals at high risk for cancer. Sometimes these trials may recruit patients that are interested in preventing recurrence of cancer okay so we should we should we stop here mm -hmm. we're going to stop here this is just slide number 10 so the other cards will go through my clinical trials presentation but they're giving it in a fun format and as you can see you have to look at the card you have to be listening 
and um, there's audience participation. So I hope that uh, you guys are interested in this particular format and are able to think of ideas or ways to incorporate this in your educational program. Are there any other questions from those of you on the phone? Oh, Jenny has a question. I was wondering that too. Okay, Jenny, you have a question? About the numbers on the, um, oh, about the numbers on the card, like the one, two, three, four, what are those? For? Okay, the numbers on the card, when I get into uh, that part of the presentation, those relates to the phases of clinical uh, trials. Phase one, two, three, and four. So we didn't get that far yet. We only got to slide number 10. There's about 24 slides in the presentation. All right, I see your comments. How many, uh, how many facilitators do you currently have? I have one facilitator myself at the current time, <laughs> and I'm hoping to get more facilitators when we do the facilitator training, or you can train yourself because I do have a training manual. Oh. Right, so Any, I would contact you for that. Yes, anybody feel free. I can go back to my uh, slide with my information on it. Feel free to contact me if you have uh, questions or want to get information on uh, bingo software or just any general questions on how to get started if you're interested in this format. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Carrie and Lynn. Oh, we're all done. Thank, thank you, guys. All right, thank, thank you, Cassandra. Thank everyone for listening in. Um, and we'll be back next month on the fourth Thursday, um, 12 o'clock. And next month will be a presentation on BCCS and uh, Medicaid for Breast and Cervical Cancer Programs, uh, Gina Lawson and Stacey Johnson from uh, Medicaid. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Bye.